Just tell me when we're live. We're live now. Greetings, 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 everyone. And welcome to another Woodson Banneker Jackson Bay Division 330 uh, RC 2020 Freedom Friday Forum. And we've got a good one for you today with someone who, uh, uh, well, a couple of folks who I'm sure you will not just enjoy what they're going to be telling you, but you'll be having an education on what is going on within the world of African cemeteries uh, in the, here in the United States that uh, um, historically have been uh, somewhat, uh, not just it's a cemetery, but it's been buried or they are being buried through the works of uh, developers. But we, we got the, before we get into anything, this being the UNIAACL, we'll start out by opening with the Universal Ethiopian Anthem. You got it there, Harold? I think I have the African be free. That's, I think that's the wrong one. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, let me say the pledge in, uh, instead, and then we'll go to the Ethiopian anthem. All right. All right. This is the official UNIA pledge to the flag. And I'll recite it, uh, folks, so you just have to listen. I commit my body, mind, and spirit to the protection, defense, and security of the red, black, and green. I dedicate my life to the redemption of Mother Africa and the liberation of her scattered black children. I accept for myself and my descendants the teachings of universal African nationalism, and I promise that our children will be instilled with the purpose and knowledge of themselves as African people in order that the cause of our struggle will neither falter nor fail until all black people are free and united through one God, one aim, one destiny. Are we ready with the anthem? Not yet. <laughs> okay, well, folks, yeah. Uh, while we're trying to get some technicalities uh, taken care of, uh, we will. I, I'll also give you a rundown of what's coming up this evening. Uh, we'll have, we'll have some spoken word by Evergreen Productions. Uh, uh, some remarks by myself regarding what we're doing this evening. Uh, that's from seven until 7.30. Hopefully we'll be, by 7.30, we'll be ready for the introduction of the presenters who are Dr. Marshall Coleman Adebayo and the Reverend Shigun Adebayo. Okay, uh, after that, uh, we will have the presentation and discussion between uh, eight and, and uh, 9.15. And then we'll have some question and answer and, uh, and some closing remarks after that. So uh, if we are ready with the anthem, we'll do that at this moment. Now, we also have uh, a video uh, presentation, which will come just before uh, or after the introduction uh, and, and just before the presentation and discussion.
Well, it looks like we're having quite a bit of difficulty pulling that one up. I don't know why we, we keep having this problem. Somebody does not want us to play that anthem, that Ethiopian anthem that calls on the African people to be united, that calls on the African people to stay together. I'm working for the land of the free. So my brother, if, if, if that is becoming too much of an issue, uh, it's coming from, um, okay, great. That sounds like it.
Thank you, Brother Heru, for that, uh, folks. Uh, let me uh, reintroduce myself. Uh, I am Baba Mosi Matsimila, president of the Woodson Banneker Jackson Bay Division 330, uh, UNIAACL, the Rehabilitating Committee 2020. And tonight, this is the, we're having our second uh, forum, Freedom Friday Forum for the year 2021. And with us, our, our guest, Dr. <coughs> Marsha Coleman Adebayo. And uh, she is going to be a presenter tonight, as well as with uh, the Reverend uh, Shigun Adebayo. Her husband, and they are they are the people who are are doing this marvelous work in Bethesda, Maryland, and that is trying to protect that African cemetery where our ancestors lay and where developers have moved in and would like to uh, further bury them, but bury them away from us, giving our respects. To our ancestors. Uh, Brother Heru, I would it would be good for us now to play that um, second video with the spoken word by Evergreen Productions. Our program is usually one in which we have some uh, cultural piece prior to our discussion. Uh, on the, so this is it right now, Evergreen Productions will give us a, a piece by uh, Patrick Battlefield. Is there and I'm on fire, on fire. 
Okay, uh, thank you again, Brother Harrow, for bringing that up. And I apologize for what, you know, we, we, we sometimes don't get 100% of what we would like uh, in a video. Uh, and, um, you know, the audio is compromised when we don't do that. But uh, that was Brother Patrick Battersfield with the Evergreen Productions. And he was uh, doing a piece wherein he is calling on the ancestors. And he's saying he's, the ancestors are there and he's on fire and ready to do the work. So uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that piece for whatever well, much we were able to hear it. Uh, uh, next, we're going to go, um, well, I said I would have some opening remarks. Uh, but I don't know if, if I can uh, do justice with an opening remark regarding um, the African burial grounds, African cemeteries uh, with our ancestors. I, I, I just know a little of what uh, is being done by uh, Dr. Marsha and, um, and her husband and, and, and the church and the, the, the coalition she has uh, in, in uh, Bethesda. And so I'm, I, I prefer to let her do the, much of the talking. And, and uh, we will, I guess, discuss this from what we hear from her. And so before uh, anything else, let me uh, give you a background of Dr. Marsha. And uh, she, you know, this is going to be short, but believe me, uh, um, there's nothing short about what she's been doing. It'll, it'll take us quite a, a while uh, for her to, to give her full bio. So Dr. Marsha Adebayo is the author of the Pulitzer Prize nominated No Fear, a whistleblower's triumph over corruption and retaliation of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, she worked at the Environmental Protection Agency for 18 years and represented the White House on the issue of the environment to the Nelson Mandela administration in South Africa. Marsha blew the whistle on a U.S. multinational corporation that endangered South African vanadium mine workers. Dr. Coleman Adebayo faced substantial retaliation and that threat for blowing the whistle. As a result, uh, Marsha successfully sued the federal government her lawsuit and subsequent testimonies before Congress led to the introduction and passage of the first civil rights and whistleblower law of the 21st century, the notification of federal employees 
Anti-Discrimination and Retaliation Act of 2002, also known as the No Fair Act. Time Magazine compared Dr. Coleman Adebayo to Rosa Parks. Marsha was inducted into the Maryland Women's Hall of Fame in March 2017. Currently, she is working on two books and providing leadership to stop developers from their ongoing desecration of an African background in Bethesda, Maryland. So that's a short piece on Dr. Adebayo. Uh, and, uh, you know, she did not mention she's also a programmer on WPFW. Uh, she has a monthly, I think. Uh, is that the fourth Wednesday in the month? Every fourth Wednesday of the Every month. Every fourth Wednesday of the month. Uh, yes, she has a program on on uh, WPFW. Um, and the name of that program is? What's at Stake. What's at Stake. Mm -hmm. So you see, she's nobody to play with. So uh, uh, I, will, I will turn everything over to her now. But oh, I think she wants us to play the video. Uh, yeah, there's a video that was uh, produced by some uh, young artists in the Washington, D.C. area. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it tells quite a story. So I, um, I, think your, I think your audience will be interested in the video. It's very OK. Well, it's, it's, we, we, we're streaming live on Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, let, let's, uh, let's hope. And then it, it'll be there. For uh, forever, so to speak, so people can come back to see it over and over, uh, and to listen to what you have to say because we do need to get together to do the work of uh, bringing respect to our ancestors. Yes. All right, uh, Baba. Glance to treat us equally, but no more. The alarm clock has gone off. It is time for America to get off off its ass and wake up. We cannot and we will until America, alongside the rest of the world, recognizes that Black Lives Matter. <laughs> Yeah, 
Look at, look at Ruben. He says, rob the culture, and then erase it. And that's exactly what we're seeing. But the point we're trying to make is that this has gone on again and again and again. And it is going on all over the country. But here at Moses, here on River Road, we are making history because we are telling people this is what is happening, this is what has happened, and this will, if we are not careful, continue to happen. If we do not take down a white supremacist system. <laughs> look like for the descendants of a once thriving African colony on River Road in Montgomery County, Maryland. This community founded by kidnapped West and Central African people had survived 300 years of barbaric and savage treatment by early European American settlers. After emancipation, they and their descendants built their lives in the primary arteries of modern day Bethesda, despite the terror of lynchings and Jim Crow segregation. I was born here, right here on River Road. Go down by Whole Foods, and I can show you the little football fields and the yard. Things where I actually lived at, the labor there. But you cannot tell me about River Road, but it was a black community. And I have a brother here right now that just walked up, was born and raised here with me. right next 
next to uh, a church that we uh, have a family where we helped start. Um, so that's really where my roots are um, in the South. Hello, my name is Dante Pope, vocalist, drummer, producer, and teaching artist from Chicago, right here in the DMV for the past 13 years. I'm an African American, an African American artist that comes from a tradition uh, rooted within the Black church, rooted within the community, and rooted within standing and supporting all people, but specifically Black people. I come from a city of Chicago where people who even in death were segregated against, like in many other cities, we have a plethora of black owned funeral homes that for decades, almost centuries, have serviced people of color who were denied those services in death due to Jim Crow laws and segregation laws. To this day, as a result, we have both cemeteries and funeral homes that service our people. But to this day, the difficulty to keep those places going, strong, and uninterrupted has been interrupted by white supremacy and most of all, capitalism. I'm here to speak up on behalf of all of those who are being dug up, swept to the side, and cast away for the purpose of developments and money. It's unfair, it's not right, and so that's why I use my art to speak out against these thoughts. trench and I'm gonna cover it over. Yeah. The best of my estimate, this is about a 90 foot trench that he built. And he pushed everything that was involved in the cemetery down in that trench. And he covered over the foot of The body parts were spread all out in that area down by the branches. 
Standing on sacred ground. If you can reach down and touch the ground. You would have that somebody would not dig up your burial ground. You would have owed that your burial ground after you spent your time on this side of Jordan. You would have owed that somebody would have put a, a ball over where your life. And when your loved ones put you in the ground, they find it down. Let us speak. Let us speak. Well, I, 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 I'll be there to the very end of the week. My point is obvious what I'm saying. It's simply that this is a critical moment for history, not only for our children, but for how we treat each other as humans. After it got it covered up like the water, leveled it off, put asphalt on top of it. Left some of the woods there, where some of the remains should be still today. They left some of that there. And they proceeded on to build that high rise. And the high rise was opened in 1968. Thank you very much, Brother Hero. That came through all right. And uh, Dr. Marshall, I, I, you know, what can I say? Uh, that that was very informative. It shows um, that there's work to be done. And I mean, I I I have never been there. I'm I'm ashamed to say, but uh, you know, I'm not. The knowledge of that is uh, is sparse, but um, I can assure you, it's not going to be like that in the future. Mm, thank you. Um, we need to do a lot more, and I, I I I do congratulate you and credit all those people who came together with you um, to do the work of preserving that cemetery. 
and uh, it, it's it's just something telling about how this country is historically. Mm -hmm. um, I heard you shouting, "The land is stolen." I think that was your voice. Mm -hmm. uh, but what does history tell us about Europeans coming to this country? Everything that's of this country has been stolen by Europeans. Mm -hmm. Of course, we are part and parcel uh, and, and uh, of um, of that scenario, and um, we have to do something about changing the way things are going or continue to go now uh just just uh, i heard I, I i i think i read something that says um a lot of the land a lot of the cemeteries in this entire country a lot of the african cemeteries or our burial grounds uh, we've lost the ownership of those grounds they're no longer owned by Africans. Mm -hmm. And so those who disrespect us and who have no feelings about who's there, mm -hmm. they can do what they want with those lands unless, unless of course, we step forward mm -hmm. and deny them that privilege. Mm -hmm. So I will, from what you, we've just seen, I'll, I'll let you continue uh, to you, let you make your presentation uh, coming right out of that. Uh, tell us uh, how you, how that came about and 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 um, where is it at this point in time? Mm. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting us to to. Um, to spend time with you and to spend this space with you because um, you know you said how much you want to work with us and that means the world to us mm -hmm. uh, because this is a very lonely struggle mm -hmm. um, the struggle around black men being murdered in the streets is a much larger struggle um, and more people sort of understand the immediacy of you know, a policeman killing a young black man. And I have a, a son, um, you know, six to uh, 200 pounds. And every time he would go out at night, I would go to sleep until he comes back in um, only to find out it was my daughter actually who had to confront a policeman one night um, when he put a gun to her head and, um, and asked her, um, you know, why she was in the neighborhood she was in and mm. uh, as though she didn't have a right to be mm. a place in the world she wanted to be, right? Um, so um, our position is that we are dealing with white supremacy at the foundational level. And when you see black men being murdered on the street, that's really a symptom of the basic foundational problem. The murdering in the street is a result of what you've just seen. And that is that Africans came to this country um, and we were kidnapped and, and then tortured into producing for these people. Um, so um, I have to do something before I start my presentation mm. um, because last um, summer we had a king who visited with us um, from, uh, from Benin. Mm. And, um, and one of the things he left with us was that every time we have this discussion, before we get into a long intellectual heavy talk about this, First, we've got to give honor to our ancestors because they are the ones that are leading us in so many ways. Every time an African cemetery is desecrated, it's equivalent to burning down a library. Mm. It's equivalent to destroying a part of our souls. And no one does that. No one would consider desecrating if you desecrate a Jewish cemetery in this country, you go to jail. 
If you desecrate a Confederate cemetery in this country, you go to jail. But if you desecrate an African cemetery, the people who are trying to protect the cemetery go to jail. Huh. So, so that is that that is sort of the way things are turned upside down in terms of white supremacy. So if you don't mind, I need to say their names because yeah. now you've seen where they've been desecrated. And, and now, um, even though their ashes and their artifacts are now lying in a um, landfill, um, and they were put in the back of dump trucks and carted off maybe about 67 dump trucks um, were brought in and they were carted off to a landfill. Um, there are ancestors. They still love us, we still love them. Therefore, it's important that we honor them. So I'm going to say their names and um, even though, and if everyone who's listening to this could just say their names with me. Um, so I'm gonna call their names out. Charlotte Gray. Charlotte Gray, Ashe. Ashe. Mary Brown. Ashe, Mary Brown. Jane Rivers Brooks. Jane Rivers Brooks, Ashe. Nelson Warren, Jr. Nelson Warren Jr., I say. Robert Allen Warren. Robert Allen Warren, I say. Nelson Warren, Sr. Nelson Warren, Sr., I say. Jerry Butts. Jerry Butts, I say. Charles Henry Brown. Charles Henry Brown, I say. Mary Jackson. Mary Jackson, I say. Nanny Warren. Nanny Warren, I say. Henry Jackson. Henry Jackson, I say. John Burley. John Burley, I say. Jeremiah Graves. Jeremiah Gray, I say. George Jackson. George Jackson, I say. William H. Brown. William H. Brown, I say. Marie Blackenberg. Marie Blackenberg, I say. Tugaloo Burley. Tugaloo Burley, I say. Susan Elizabeth Warren. Susan Elizabeth Warren, I say. Charles Brown. Charles Brown, I say. And Cora Butts. Cora Butts, I say. Ashe. Yes. Those are some of the names that we know. We know that there may be thousands there, but at least those are the names we have right now. Hmm. And even though they were never considered human beings in life, um, it is incumbent upon us who, um, their children, uh, who carry on this struggle uh, to, to make sure that their humanity is known to everyone. Um, so let me start off by just saying that I found this quote from Fannie Lou Hamer that I wanted to share with everyone. And Fannie Lou Hamer said, there are things I feel strong about. One is not to forget where I come from. And the other is to praise the bridge that carried us over. So I'm going to propose today that the River Road Moses Cemetery is that bridge mm. that carried us over. Mm -hmm. It's the bridge that helped us deal with all the dimensions of structural white supremacy. And when a society is determined to desecrate the graves of your ancestors, on a political level, this is an act of war. This is an act of war. Um, and it's one of the indications of genocide of a people. 
desecrating graves and assassinating black leaders or exiling black leaders like they did the honorable Marcus Garvey are in fact acts of genocide. Mm -hmm. And for example, today I was listening to democracy now and, and we learned today what we've always suspected. And I think we knew in our hearts and that is that Malcolm X was assassinated by the United States government. Now, you know, we knew that, but we couldn't prove it. But now we got the information. And we all know that Malcolm X's father was a member of the UNIA. Yes, indeed. And so I found a quote from Malcolm um, that I wanted um, to, 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 uh, to, that speaks to my spirit at least. Um, in terms of how I think you, you see the kind of movement we've built. It is a very much in your face activist movement. We stop trucks with our bodies. Hmm. Yeah. You saw that we yes. stop trucks, yes. we stop these trucks with our bodies and we do not allow them to go and desecrate. And so, so when I saw this quote from Malcolm, I wanted to share it with my UNIA brothers and sisters. And as you know, my grandmother was in the UNIA. Mm -hmm. And so I am a UNIA baby. <laughs> and, and Malcolm X said at the founding of the Afro-American Organizational Unity um, that our objective is to fight whoever gets in our way. Mm -hmm. To bring about the complete independence of people of African descent here in the Western Hemisphere, but first in the United States and bring about the freedom of these people by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. And he says, that's our motto, that's our motto. We want freedom by any means necessary. We want justice by any means necessary. We want equality by any means necessary. And he goes on to say, we don't feel that in 1964, living in a country that is supposedly based upon freedom and supposedly the leader of the free world, we don't think that we should have to sit around and wait for some segregationist congressmen and senators and a president from Texas in Washington, DC to make up their minds that our people are due now some degree of civil rights. And then he goes on to say something which I think is really the most, one, the most important part of the entire two paragraphs. He says, no, we want it now. Or we don't think anybody should have it. And to me, one of the things that I loved about Malcolm, and I grew up in Detroit um, when the Black Muslim, when the, when, the Mus when the Nation of Islam was, I guess, really at its apex um, was I love this spirit of demanding, not asking, not begging, but demanding freedom mm -hmm. because we are human beings. We don't have to be anything else. All we have to be is just human beings. And that gives us the right to freedom. Mm -hmm. So, so, so for those of us in BACC, which is Bethesda African Cemetery Coalition, um, we've taken the position that freedom is non-negotiable and that it's not an intellectual exercise, that Black lives matter both in life and in death. And the way the Bible says it is very interesting. Uh, in Exodus 3, when God brought Moses to the place of the burning bush, he was instructed, do not approach here. Remove your sandals from off your feet for the place on which you stand is holy ground. So for us in BACC, Moses is holy ground. Mm. That's the reason why we can stop trucks with our bodies because we okay. are stopping trucks because we are standing on holy ground. Okay. So Moses is the bridge that brought us, um, that, 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 that brought us the knowledge of our ancestors, helping us understand European barbarism. 
is helping us understand European barbarism. And European historians have been very clever with language. Mm. You know, they, they don't call us Africans, they call us slaves. Because if they called us Africans, then they'd have to say, this is a Nigerian, or this is someone from Songhai, or this is from someone from Khartoum Bornu, or this is from Ghana. But by saying we're a slave, it's almost like you don't have a country. You don't come from anywhere. You just somehow dropped out the sky somewhere. And the question is, well, how did you get here and where did you come from? And if you start talking about where did you come from, then you got to talk about kidnapping. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to go there. They just want to say these are non-nationals. These are people who just, just uh, appeared somehow and we started selling them. They didn't have a history. They didn't have a culture uh, until we found them. Um, and so... So, so Moses, so one of the reasons why it's so important to erase cemeteries like Moses is because that's where the stories are. That's the history and you can't deny that history. And so what they have to do is they got to put a parking lot on top of it, or they put a shopping mall on top of it, or they just completely, they just dig them up and take them someplace because they do not want people to understand where they come from. That, that we were human, that we are human beings deserving of, of everything other human beings. And if we don't have it, then nobody else is supposed to have it. Um, so, so for those of us in BACC, we live in our resistance. We live in our resistance. And we not only talk about truth and justice, but we testify before you know, uh, the Maryland Assembly. We place our bodies in the street. You saw the video. Uh, we march, we sing, um, we deal with the police. You saw the police harassing us, arresting us. Um, and we do it in our resistance because that is what we do as human beings when we are under oppression, we fight back. So what do we want? Um, we want the land that was stolen from our people returned back to the only institution that is left of Black people on River Road. They completely wiped out the entire Black community on River Road. Not one family survived. Not one family survived. And those black people, they worked until they bled mm. on river roads, farming and, and going to the quarry and, and doing everything that they needed to do to survive. And, and the white, um, gov the government, the Montgomery County government, the federal government, the developers, they came in, they all worked together and they stole every single piece of land from these Black people. I should tell you and back up a little bit that to tell you how incredible this community was, three years after what, what these European, white Europeans like to call slavery, we call it what it is, European barbarism. Three years at the end of European barbarism, these Black folks had bought almost half the road that you, that you just saw in the video. They had worked so hard, pulled their money together, and they had bought all that land. In fact, that land, in fact, they had even stopped, they didn't even call that land Bethesda anymore. The black community called it Graysville after a black woman who bought so much land, they decided to name that area in her honor. Can you imagine three years after people have been beating you, raping you, torturing you, you shake yourself off and you start buying land. Wait, mm. What kind of people, do, how do you do that? Resilience, do do African that? resilience. What, how do you do that? Mm. But that's what we did on River Road. But then around 1926, the Klan was developed. The Klan was established, I should say. And so between the Klan, between the planning board, between all the various agencies, the community folded. It not folded, they, the land was stolen. 
and they were literally terrorized off mm. of the land. So what do we want? We want the land returned. Because when you steal something, you're supposed to return it. So we want the land returned. And we also, what we'd like to do now is to um, create a beautiful museum where we can put all the artifacts that we have now um, uh, found and, and by whatever methods, we'd like to, to, to have a place where, where the oral histories can be recorded, where the artifacts that have been found in this cemetery We'd like to have a place where school children can go and learn about their history and, and be proud of this community. The community on River Road actually built the bunkers under the White House. When, when, when these guys were running for their lives a couple of weeks ago, hmm. they went to the bunkers that the people on River Road built. We were also some of the builders of the US Capitol that the Proud Boys breached a couple of weeks ago. Now they send the police after us, but those proud boys were climbing up the walls of the US, of US Capitol and not one policeman shot one of them. Not one policeman. If that had been black bodies climbing up the US Capitol, they would have used it as target practice, mm. right? But not, not, but not with white supremacists. So, so we understand that those are their kin folks and they're not going to kill them. So, 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 so let me just be real clear and say that our history did not start in Bethesda, Maryland. Our history did not start in Montgomery County. Our history did not start in Maryland. Our history did not start in America. Our history started in Africa. Mm -hmm. Our history started 3000 years ago. So what they've tried to do is to say, you know, our history started 300 years ago. No, 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 no. Our history started 3000 years ago. So no one should have been surprised when the first vaccines, when it was an African man who, who, who was able to explain to an American businessman, I think was one of the early, you know, founders of Johnson and Johnson or one of the pharmaceutical industries, how to, to curtail vaccine, he was probably a student, a, a, a medical student at one of the universities in Africa and had been captured and brought to the United States. But we keep thinking that our history started here. And so we just, we keep sort of shrinking who we really are. I mean, the history of Africa is, is, is the history of humanity. It is where we first started as human beings. So the descendants of Moses and the River Road community came from societies that came from very complex agricultural um, uh, communities. They had advanced techniques around food production and crops and they, in, they engaged in local, regional, international trading. I mean, there were ambassadors from Africa and Europe in the 1500s, right? Um, they, they were skilled miners and metallurgists and artists and, and, and scientists and, and, and moms and dads and farmers. I mean, we, we, we you know, we, we, we scaled the entire, uh, you know, complexity of, of humanity. So it was that sophisticated technological advancement in agriculture and medicine and hydrology and mining and science that made Africa the prize for Europeans. It wasn't an accident that Europeans decided to go to Africa and bring people to this country. They knew that that's where the knowledge was. So they put all their money and their resources into going to where the, where the people were who had the knowledge that could provide the kind of corporate agricultural development that they needed in this country. And so by 1619, um, more than a century and a half after the Portuguese first started um, this very savage trade in human beings, uh, European ships began to bring millions of Africans with all of this knowledge to the United States. 
um, we don't call it slavery. We call it what it is again, which was human trafficking. They were all engaged in human trafficking. Uh, so for 400 years, 54,000 voyages from Africa to what they call the new world. All of our knowledge is being transferred from Africa to, 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 the, Western, to the Western world. And then what they did was they stripped us of our citizenship by the 13th Amendment to the US Constitution. That's the reason why, you know, I'm not Nigerian and I traced my ancestry back to Cameroon. They stripped us without a plebiscite. There was no national plebiscite of Africans to say, do you want to be an American? They passed the 13th Amendment and said, this is your nationality now. You're now American. No one asked us. No one asked. There was never a vote. The, big, the, the vote for me, to be honest with you, was really Marcus Garvey, though. Because as my grandmother used to tell me, Marcus Garvey had the largest movement of Black people that she had ever seen in her life. It, it made the civil rights movement dwarf compared to what Marcus Garvey had put together. And as I told you before, my grandmother had her ticket. She had her ticket. Mm -hmm. And if things had been different, if things had been different, you and I would be having a very different conversation. So I'm going to sort of... Um, Fast forward a bit, because I did want to talk about what happened to what we call the little girls, okay. what we happened. And I think it's a bit unfair that we only talk about girls because boys were also subject to sexual abuse by Europeans. Um, but because girls could obviously have children, they were the one, they were the primary target of this kind of uh, barbarism. So on River Road uh, in Bethesda, uh, basically uh, the soil produced tobacco and tobacco as you know, was, um, was, 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 was a luxury item, but it fetched a very high price, particularly in Europe. So a lot of the tobacco that was grown here on River Road was not actually sold here in America. It was sold in Europe, in Liverpool, Manchester. So when you talk about African-Americans or Africans in this country uh, building America, you also must say that Africans in this country built Europe because there wasn't a single European man or woman who wore cotton that our blood was not on, that, on, that, on their clothing. We not only built America, we also built Europe between the United States and Africa, the wealth of Europe came from black people. All the little crowns in the queen's tiara mm. came from Africa or outside of Europe. They don't mine diamonds in, in, in Great Britain. Even her crown has African diamonds in it. Mm -hmm. So, so, so but, but tobacco is very difficult on the soil. It takes up a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. So it started to deplete the soil. And so the, the profits started to decline. At the same time around 1807, you get what they call the closing of the transatlantic slave trade. And that's when Europeans here are thinking, why in the world are we going to Africa when we can just force Africans to breed here. And we don't have to brave these horrible weather conditions going back and forth from the United States. We don't have to pay these exorbitant insurance policies for our ships and our cargo and the sailors. And so they created an internal um, sexual violence um, industry here in the United States. And there were three states that were carved out to produce Africans who would be delivered to the Deep South, Washington, DC, Virginia, and Maryland. And so these Southerners would come from Mississippi and Georgia to Washington, DC, or Virginia once or twice a year, and they would, and they would buy African girls, or they would buy Africans and take them back to the Deep South. So on River Road, there was one, 
that we found so far. One, one deaf camp, what Europeans like to call plantations, that had so many girls that we realized that this could not be a tobacco plantation because tobacco was very hard to grow. There were a lot of little girls here. And we realized that in fact, this particular deaf camp, in fact, was engaged in what Europeans call breeding, which was the breeding of little African girls to produce more Africans to be sold to the deep south. Now we know that even today, there's a very high rate of, of death for African-American women doing childbirth. So you can imagine how many little girls died during this period of history. They just bled out. Those little girls would also be in the pits that you saw in the film and a part of Moses African Cemetery. So um, I think I'm going to sort of begin to wrap up the presentation here. I did want just to make a couple more points. Um, Cause I know this is sort of, if you've not, if you're not sort of drenched in this history, it's, it's, it's hard because um. it's a very painful history of what our people went uh -huh. through. I did want to talk about um, a comparison, though, because people can say, well, you know, a lot of people really suffered, um, but, but, not, but not, not, not like Africans. There, there's no other, uh, Native Americans would be the closest example. And they were, of course, the victim as well of genocide, but in terms of white, in terms of white settlers. So I want to just talk a little bit about Nathan um, Loughborough. There were four main plantations on River Road. You'd know, you wouldn't know that by the pictures you just saw. You saw Bank of America, Whole Foods, this, this. But if you close your eyes, mm. there were four main plantations there. The Loughborough, Councilman, Shoemaker, and Posey. And then there's a place that you saw on a little hill called Macedonia Baptist Church. Mm. The that is what they call the slave quarters in those days. That's where all these four plantations had their Africans. We, we, we prefer to consider this more of a command center because we know that what those Africans were doing was really trying to figure out how they were gonna get from, from Bethesda to Washington DC or, and then try, try to find their way maybe to Canada. Um, but they were trying to get away from these people to the extent possible. But the Loughboroughs bought some land in 1808 and it became literally the center of the Confederacy in Bethesda. Now people don't think about Bethesda as being a part of the Confederacy. That's because the history, it's never been told to our people. But in fact, the Loughboroughs were at the center. Now you can actually walk to the Loughborough, um, what, we would, what they would have called in those days, the big house from, from River Road. It's, 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 it's considered a national monument. Mm. By, the, by, the, by the National Park Service. It's amazing how they, how they have been able to reproduce their own history. And when you see this house, it looks like something out of Gone with the Wind. I mean, it's like one of these big fancy houses. Um, um, but, but what was happening in that house was the criminal sale of Africans, was rape, was murder. But you won't read about that when you talk about the Loughboroughs. In fact, I was asking my husband, where have I seen that name before? And it's the street that American University sits on, Massachusetts Avenue in Loughborough. Ah. There's, this, there's, there's still, that, that, <clears throat> you go to downtown Potomac, downtown Potomac is Councilman and River Road. So these people are named, these, these, these monsters have street names after them. So they're still being honored. We got to change that around. Anyway, let me just say the half, the this this Loughborough big house is kept in pristine condition, thanks to taxpayers like us, and it's listed as a national treasure, but it's really a, a shrine to the Confederacy, uh, and they don't have to worry about desecration like we do. They don't have to worry about desecration 
um, like like people like like us. Uh, for example, James Henry Lockborough, he fought for the for the Confederacy. He was attached to Stonewall Jackson. Um, he was actually in what they call the Signal Corps, which is the modern day, what we would call the modern day CIA or intelligence, right? Because he was sort of playing that role of being a northerner, but he was really fighting for the South and, you know, doing his little James Bond thing. Um, and they were actually locking up troops that were fighting against slavery in the Loughborough House, right off of River Road here in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, and then in 1862, um, he decides to get married. And who is the guest of honor? The wife of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis's wife. Wow. Is, uh, exactly. So you're talking about high society, right? Hmm. Um, so, so the question that we have to ask is, you know, which institution do you think survived in Bethesda? Was it the Loughborough House? or is it the African burial ground? And they call the Loughborough House Milton, that was named after a relative. But anyway, um, but, but the Loughborough House, and which, so which one do you think survived? Which one is being desecrated? So I would just like your, your, your audience to, to think about that. And I think this spring, which your, your spoken word uh, folks and dancers that I've seen before, I think we should go there. I think all of us should go to the to the Milton House, to the Big House, to the Lockborough House. Mm -hmm. I think we should pour libation to mm -hmm. our ancestors right there where they worked, where they died, where they were raped. I think we should dance and we should sing and we should praise them and we should thank them for being the bridge that brought us over. I think we need to respect our ancestors and we need to keep fighting for our ancestors. So what have we been doing lately? Um, we just won a, a, a major award, uh, 400 years of African-American history award. Um, so we are actually now working to tell this history um, and we're going to organize a tabletop exhibit where we can take it all over the country and we can tell the history that I've just started to tell you tonight. Uh, in addition, uh, we, we have some BACC inspired legislation, um, which, is, uh, which is HB 1099, called the Historic African American Cemeteries Preservation Fund and Study. We'd like to work with you on that. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have to turn this legislation around because right now it only um, benefits white historians and white preservationists. And, we, and we're demanding that all the money and all the resources are sent to our community and not to their community. So let me end as I started um, mm -hmm. with a quote um, from another Maryland woman named Harriet Tubman, uh -huh. who we believe had a station of her Underground Railroad at Macedonia, where you saw the pictures today. Uh -huh. And I told you what they called a slave quarter and it's across the street from the cemetery. And so now, um, you know, um, Baba Mosi, we're gonna have to do call and response again. Yes, indeed. Okay. So the response that I need from you is um, keep going. Okay, so yes. I'll point to you when, it's, when, when I need this, okay. So this is what Harriet Tubman said. If you hear the dogs. Keep going. If you see the torches in the woods, keep going. If they're shouting after you, keep going. Don't ever stop. Keep going. If you want a taste of freedom, keep going. Keep going. Keep, keep going. going. Keep, keep going. going. So yeah. in the name of our ancestors, um, we intend to keep going. Yes. We intend to keep going. And we're like Harriet and we're like the Honorable Marcus Garvey. We're not going to relinquish the fight to stop the desecration. And we're praying that UNIA, because we know if Marcus Garvey was here, we know where he would be. We know where he would be. He would be stopping trucks with us. So um, I thank you so much for this opportunity. And um, and as, as you know, my grandmother always taught me one God. One God. 
One aim. One aim. One destiny. One destiny. Ashe. Ashe, my sister. Thank you very much for that presentation. You're welcome. Uh, now, my husband. Wonderful. Is here. Thank you. Yes. Yes, Reverend Shagun. Hey, Baba Mosi. <laughs> Thank, thanks, thanks for having us. Uh, oh, thank you for being part of this. I didn't send a bio. My wife uh, instructed me that I should give you uh, a little, you know, uh, uh, you know, sketch of my of my bio, uh, you know, before I, you know, make some remarks. So that's uh, that's appropriate. Yeah. Okay. The short one would be, you know, it's fine. Whatever, whatever you are willing to bring forward to us at this point in time is welcome okay first well let me you know express my thanks for this uh, this opportunity and this privilege here to you know speak with you baba mosi and the unia uh you know nation uh on this this evening uh my full name is uh abiose um and uh, let me just uh, break that down abiose means somebody that was born on a sunday Okay. I was born on a Sunday many, many uh, months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. My middle, middle name is uh, Ulusheg, which means God has given us victory. And of course, my last name is Adeba. I was, you know, born and raised in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, when I think, uh, you, know, you know, I believe when I was 18 years old, after my, you know, secondary school education, I, I traveled to the then Soviet Union. Uh, USSR. Mm -hmm. That's why I pursued the, you know, my, you know, my my initial degree uh, in university in uh, aerospace aerospace engineering. Oh my goodness! And then on, on completing that, uh, you know, I was blessed to, you know, come to the US. I say blessed because that's when I met my my <laughs> lovely wife. <laughs> 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 yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, and I give thanks. <laughs> no, we, we met. We met at MIT, where I, you know, did my PhD in uh, aeronautics and astronautics. Uh, and so once I, you know, completed that, uh, went back to Nigeria. Uh, among other things, I served in the Air Force in Nigeria, and uh, I left uh, after a few years. Uh, as a major, uh, discharged honorably, and then came back uh, to the U.S. to to live with my bride. Uh -huh. And uh, for 38 years, I was a professor and uh, a prof in an associate dean in the School of Engineering at the University of the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. I retired uh, just about uh, 18 months ago. Uh, and my my my. My assignment in retirement has been, uh, you know, Moses Cemetery. Uh, let me also say that I was ordained uh, as a Baptist minister, uh, you know, back in uh, 2000, and, uh, and I've been the, you know, the seventh pastor. Actually, I'm the eighth pastor of uh, the Macedonia Baptist Church that uh, my wife uh, spoke about, um, you know, since. Uh, you know, almost uh, five years now. So that just gives you a quick, uh, you know, uh, you know, brief, uh, you know, bio uh, of me without going to, you know, greater details of things that I've actually done. Uh, one of the things I want to speak to you briefly about is, uh, is just the, the, the state of, uh, you know, the, the black nation, the state of the black nation. We've been in struggle uh, over the preservation of uh, Moses Cemetery now for almost uh, five years. It's been a very lonely struggle. Mm -hmm. Been a very lonely struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you you know come to any of our rallies and protests, you probably will be dismayed that probably eighty percent of those that show up, you know, to help us to defend and protect and preserve. In our ancestral, you know, burial ground, our white people. Mm. Uh, we can get black people to respond. We can get black people to respond, and and those who respond, I always remind them. I said, listen, you know, I'm from Nigeria, and I know that a lot of my people are brought from Nigeria, you know, to this country. 
uh, no telling that some of those that are buried in Moses Cemetery could be my blood relatives. Mm. Uh, but not even withstanding, either they are my blood relatives or not, you know, they are my brothers and they are my sisters. And therefore, for me, I see it as a sacred obligation uh, that I must fight uh, to preserve their resting place so that they can rest in peace. Uh, because one of the things that we know in African culture is that ancestors, they are never far from us. Their spirit is always around us. And so we've been fighting against uh, the local government, uh, you know, various government agencies. And just because, you know, we raise our voice, we are considered, you know, the bad, you know, the bad Negroes. Uh, <laughs> that yeah. the Negroes. In, in fact, they have found a group of other black people not too far from us whom they consider more palatable, uh, mm. more pliant, uh, uh, you know, more, more accepting of their ways. But we, we have stood up, we have fought. Uh, the, the history is that uh, the, the land around the church and, you know, thanks to God without Macedonia, nobody will even know that we ever existed on River Road. Mm. You know, while they stole all the land, all the acreage that Masha spoke about, uh, at some point, the, the population of uh, African, African-American people on River Road, you know, grew up to about 250. You know, they built businesses, they built schools, and they had the community, and they had the church. Mm -hmm. They had the church, and then, of course, they had a burial place, mm -hmm. burial place. And so we have fought, you know, first to even have them to agree that there was ever a burial place in Bethesda. Uh, the first year they were in denial, obfuscating and hiding, you know, the evidence from us. And then finally a member of our church, who is now about 77 years old, came out and said, no, I, I used to play, I used to play in the cemetery. It's not an alleged cemetery. We used to play hide and no seek mm. in this place. And finally, there was a whistleblower within one of the organization, the, the, the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, that through the you know, Freedom of Information Act, or the MPI in Maryland, you know, we saw that they had communication to say, yeah, you know, when we take uh, the council members there, don't say anything to them about a former cemetery here. They bulldozed the cemetery to build a, a high-rise, uh, you know, building, mm -hmm. and the process they drove down the bones, you know, of ancestors, drove down the hill and scattered it all over the place. And so we fought, you know, to finally, you know, get them to register the, that that parcel of land, on Montgomery County, you know, inventory of cemeteries. But we demanded more than that. We said, we want to build a memorial. We want to build a museum to unearth you know, their life story, you know, to talk about their struggle, their, their resilience, their resistance, their persistence, and their contribution, not only to River Road and Bethesda, but to the nation. And so we've been fighting uh, you know, because you know, this land now has over the generations stolen and be you know, transferred to the hand of, you know, private, private land owners. So it's been a, a, a tough struggle and it's a struggle that it's not only, uh, it's not only limited to Bethesda, it's, it's all over the country, as you probably know. But a lot of, uh, you know, former, you know, burial sites that have been paved over. Some of them, they have built apartment complexes, you know, you know, malls over them and, uh, so it's, it's a national disgrace. It's a national problem, but we cannot let them, you know, do that to ancestors. Uh, as as much as said, they are the bridge that brought us over. They suffered. I mean, they suffered. I don't need to tell you and to tell your audience about this. I mean, the the the, the, the death of the suffering that they went through. And so that's the fight that we are fighting. That no, they are human. Uh, they, they, their life matters, uh, their story matters. And we have mm -hmm. done a lot of work to uncover their stories. We filed an exhibit at the American Museum uh, of, you know, the Casino Center of the American University. Uh, a few years ago, we are planning on that, you know, exhibit 
you know, devoted solely to the River Road community. And as Masha said, we are building a tabletop exhibit. So we, we find a lot of good people come around us, but we need that people around us. And so whatever we can do, whatever you can do to help us to sensitize, you know, black people to say, look, the struggle is not over. You know, white supremacy is still reigns supreme. Mm. And we have to stand up. We have to stand up. Like someone said, it's better to be uh, a dead lion than a living rat. Mm. We have to stand up. And also we have to, you know, call to the minds of our people all around the world on the continent, those in diaspora, to let them know these are their people, these are their ancestors. It's not only my ancestors or the ancestors of those who lived on River Road or went to Macedonia Baptist Church. So we need, we need help. We need to bring you know, this issue to a national audience, to a national level. We need, to, we need to proclaim it. We need to shout it on the housetops, on the rooftops, to let them know that enough is enough. Uh, our life does matter, not only in the womb, not only when we're alive, but even in the tomb, you know, our lives matter, our history does matter. So that, that, that's the struggle. And so one of the things that I know, and I thank God for UNIA, thank God for, you know, the great Honorable Marcus Gavi, Africa, I've told a lot of people, will never be all. Africa will never be all until its citizens the brothers and sisters that are in diaspora, you know, have a home on the continent. Africa will never be free until her children, her children that have been displaced from their fatherland, from their motherland, have a full right of return and citizenship and a process by which they can return profitably and safely and comfortably back to the land of their, their ancestors of their birth. So we have to come together in this new generation. Uh, it's okay that some of us are in, you know, occupy high government posts, but that, that's not freedom. That's, that's not freedom, that's not dignity. And we have to assert our own dignity, our own right, because we're not less than anyone. And we're not claiming that we are better than anyone. We are, we are equal. And we have a right to dignity and we have to right to respect. And part of that respect, you know, starts from honoring our, our, our ancestors, preserving their place of rest and celebrating them and telling their stories. So that's what we've been doing. That's what we've been doing. As you see, when you do have time to come down, you see Macedonia is a, it's a little church that sits upon the hill, but you know, always there were an amazing grace. Mm -hmm. That, you know, when they stole all that land, they couldn't touch Macedonia. They couldn't touch Macedonia because of God's power and grace. But remember now, as Masha said, we believe that Macedonia sits on top of a sacred ground. You know, that was uh, the, the, the home, you know, what they call the so-called slave, slave quarters. quarters yeah. So that land, uh -huh. we have claimed it in perpetuity. But a lot of the land that belonged to our people, they have stolen them, they have distributed them, sold them to you know, high priced uh, developers. And these developers control the politicians. And the sad thing uh, about Moses is that we have, uh, we have uh, black people in, in, in the council. I mean, it's, 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 sometimes it's easier talking to white folks than talking to them. Uh, you no, think you should be the one that should be fighting and calling us and say, look, there's the strategy, this is what you should be doing, this is what you should be saying, no. I mean, it's, it's, in fact, we found that one of them was, you know, working against us. Mm -hmm. I mean, do I need to tell you anything about the NAACP? I mean, we, we, we finally, you know, we, I, I pulled out from them. Pulled out from them. You know, talking about even the Black Ministers Conference. I mean, so we, we, we need to, we need to reassert a, a, a place. We need to reassert a place, not because, you know, we think we have a peace of the land and we have bread on our table and we have you know, all this comfort. No, I mean, we, 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 are, we are each brothers and sisters keepers. We need to find a way to join hands, you know, to work together, not only here in Bethesda, but all over to assert that the resting place, the burial place of ancestors is a sacred place and we must work together 
to preserve it. And we must demand uh, they gain respect and they gain respect and they, they acknowledge, you know, for their contribution uh, to their communities and to this nation. So let me stop there. You know, I, I know I've uh, said enough. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to, you know, share with you uh, just this little bit. Well, thank you for that, Reverend. It is indeed a pleasure to have you both on this uh, program with us. Uh, you know, what you've said here tonight has uh, inspired me. And, uh, you know, I, I had very little knowledge. I, I've, I heard about things, but I, I had not understood the relevance of the struggle. When you tell me that uh, the land was robbed, mm -hmm. taken away from the people, you know, that is what my, uh, we, we would say is a tragedy of white injustice. Mm -hmm. Marcus Garvey mm -hmm. related that and he had a poem in called or he said he has a poem called the tragedy of white injustice mm -hmm. in which a lot of this the, the these you know terrible things that that they did to african people he relayed them the tragedy of white injustice and it's it's so much of it out there it's hard to quantify mm -hmm. but we as a people we need from birth to be inculcated with the fact that we are human beings and we must be proud of ourselves. This is another thing he, Marcus Garvey spoke about mm -hmm. when he said in, in, in his, what is called the African fundamentalism mm -hmm. is that we must stop allowing other people to create our heroes. Mm -hmm. well, Stop allowing other people to choose for us. We must choose for self. Yes, sir. That is why when they had to get rid of him. Yes. Because what he was implanting in the minds of African people here in the United States was what they thought would lead to an insurrection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The fear of having African people knowing who they were or who they are, their history, their background, what they can do for self, that they're human beings capable of doing anything any other man can do. Yes, sir. That is why he started the businesses, the shipping lines, mm. he created factories, a factory that had the first, it was the first factory that produced African dolls for African children so that they can see themselves and be proud of it and love themselves instead of having to go and buy white dolls mm -hmm. as children. And especially when you, you, you know, you, you're inculcating in your mind what's beauty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're having these white dolls, bringing them up and loving them as children. What's inculcated in the mind when you do this and you become an adult mm -hmm. is that you have no respect for yourself really. You want to be somebody else exactly. because somebody's saying, if you're not white, you're not beautiful. Yes. They take away our history. They take away our names. They take away all that is our culture. They forbid you to do certain things. You know, in some places you can't even beat a drum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they understood that before the telephone, Africans relayed messages yes, sir. in the air. Mm -hmm. And so that was dangerous for them. Mm. We as a people, as, as you were saying, we must come together if we want to be 
respectable. Yes, sir. We want to respect ourselves. If we want other people to respect us. Well. In Bethesda, when they removed the economic resources for us that we had, mm -hmm. you take away the land, you take away the homes, you forbid us to even open accounts. Then you had the prejudice of all this. You can't get it alone. You have to, you know, you come together and you purchase your land. You purchase your home. Even not, this is everywhere in the world that I, you know, I was born in a place called Guyana. And uh, the people there, the, the, the ex-enslaved after, after emancipation, they bought several places and created villages. Mm. That came from money that they brought together after doing work in different places. They pooled their monies and bought land and created villages. And the very same thing, African people knew how to put things together. They knew economics. Yes. Sir. They knew how to sue sue. Yes. As they call it. Yes. <laughs> right? You mm. put your money together and cooperatively you bought land and you 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 did your, your industrious work so that everybody can benefit. Mm -hmm. Of course. You know, we, 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 some of us, we talk about African socialism. I said, when this, in this country, you use the word socialism, everybody's going crazy. Mm -hmm. But we had that. We had our village and we had our socialism. We had our country socialism. We had our kingdom socialism. We, we, everybody benefited from what we had what? because we were working for each other. Yes, sir. Until the invasion of the white man interfering with our history, using his weaponry. Mm -hmm. And now you're weaponizing culture. Mm -hmm. You're stealing every everything we create. And I mean, I don't even have to tell you folks because you under, you know and you understand our music. Yes. Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, you know, I, I don't know how many people know the story of Elvis Presley and how he became famous and whose songs he was singing. Yes. And how they stole those songs from a, a black man yes. because he was too poor to, uh, and, and needed the dollar. And they made him sign it over for very little money. Yes. And there they're running around. And he's going around making millions of dollars singing, don't step on my blue suede shoes. Mm. They stole culture. Mm -hmm. They will sit down there and learn what you do don't pay you for what you do or enough or what should be credited to you, but they learn it and then they go play and they get the money. They make millions after stealing your culture. It's been going on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, e even when it came to your talent, your creativity, You know, you talk about Metzliger, who was the, the, the man who created shoes. We were wearing shoes. He had a machine that made shoes that you don't have to sew anymore. They took that, but he didn't get credit until very late. And he, he wasn't even alive when the credit came to him. Mm. The same thing with a whole lot of our inventions and everything else. Some things were in medicine even. Well, some people out there, they know. And, and what we are doing in the UNIA at, at this very month, this uh, Black History Month on our Facebook page, you know, we have a, a brother who on a daily basis, he is uh, putting out some of that history and, and uh, giving credit to some of our people and what they've done, not just in, the, in, you know, the struggle that we've had, you know, the struggles to, to be free. Mm -hmm. even. And we and Marcus Garvey, you know, he drilled that in us. Mm -hmm. We must understand who we are and we must be self-reliant. Yes. Understanding who you are and for putting your resources together. He did it by having selling shares for his company and then they used that to convict him. 
to put him out. But making people understand uh, that cooperatively we can work together to do for self and be self-reliant is something we continue to push today in the UNIHCL. Because many of us, you know, we, we, you know, we're living in a country where we're only what, 12%. And when you see the 88% doing something quite different, you know, it's like children growing up and you're you're one 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 child in the class. I mean, I've been I've been in, you know, I don't know if you've had the experience. But I've been in classes, even in college, where I was the only black student. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if, if we had to work in groups and everything else, you know, I, I, I was always being shunted aside of somebody until I made demands. Mm -hmm. I've always had this in me. You are not better than I am. I came from a country where we were in the majority and we put the colonialists out. We struggled with them. We've got a history of struggle. And so I'm, I, when I'm not going to come here and allow myself to be brutalized, mm -hmm. mentally or physically. Well, Marcus Garvey came from a country in a similar manner, came from Jamaica, mm -hmm. and he... Uh, He's a descendant of the Maroons, the people who fought for their own freedom. You know, he had that history. And we have to tell our people because they erased some of that history here. Black people in this country did not just sit down and wait to be freed. A lot of them fought for their freedom. Mm -hmm. And they died for their freedom in the Civil War, yes. even though they weren't being paid equally, mm. even where they weren't treated equally. But they understood and they hoped that their, 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 their progeny would have a better life. Now, we can't do any different. Yes, sir. So what you're telling me here about what's happening and what you're trying to do, I am inspired to be part of that struggle. Thank you. I'm inspired to get not only the members of my division, the, the Woods and Banneker Jackson Bay Division, UNIA ACL Division 330, here in the Rehabilitating Committee of 2020. And our program right now is to raise the consciousness of our people. Okay. Because we know, despite everything you have, you know what, despite, like you were mentioning earlier, Reverend, despite the software we let, the life that some of us have. You know, we cannot forget that we do not own and control the resources that give us that type of life. And they can take it away at any time. So self-reliance is an important thing for us. And we must prove that we can do for self. And so I think that uh, from this day on, you're going to hear from me. Yeah, thank you. If, if you don't hear from anyone else coming from the UNIACL. And I have the brothers on, on who are in the technical area here helping me out with this program tonight. They are fighters as well. Brother Heru, you know, he works with young people. He, uh, he's an engineer and, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's part and parcel of, uh, of a program that is, uh, I think it's called the STEM, where he, you know, teaching young people the sciences. Mm. Uh, and and uh, Brother Zamo, he is our, our technical person. He made that flyer that you like so much. Yeah, I love it. You know, so mm -hmm. uh, it's Brother Zamo, uh, you're hearing it from, 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 from Dr. Marcia herself. She says she loves that flyer and, you know, we, 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 we are working, we have a lot of other members who are in the struggle. They may be watching on, on the Facebook page. They're doing that to do it. But we shall be with you. All right. I promise you that. Thank you. Thank you. you know, it's, it's, it, it would be a pleasure for me to do that. And I, what I have to tell you that when we come out there and we do things, we have that red, black, and green. 
Yes. That red, black, and green flag that tells anyone that, you know, we have that motto, one God, one aim, one destiny. Mm -hmm. But behind that, it's also, we stand our ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We believe in self-reliance. We believe in self-respect. Mm -hmm. We believe that we can do anything any other man can do. As Marcus Garvey has said, And the, pro the, the, the project that we have is towards that future when our children, when, when, when our people can see for themselves that they don't have to depend on anyone else. It's, it's, it may take a hundred years, it may not happen in our lifetime, but we are going to work towards it. You know, we've had our ins and outs, we've had, you know, like you were mentioning about some of the politicians, et cetera. You know, we have our sellouts. Yes, sir. We have those people who will sabotage us. Mm -hmm. We have those people who will pull the rug from under our feet. Mm -hmm. We have those people who will spy on us. Yes. They spied on, you know, J. Edgar Hoover paid some black folks to spy on Marcus Garvey. Part mm -hmm. of the problem that Marcus Garvey had was that they were black people who were willing to sell themselves mm -hmm. because they had no hopes for the future. Mm -hmm. For them, money is it. Mm -hmm. And we still have those people. Mm -hmm. But we need to show them that there's something more than that. It's the courage to work with our people and to bring them to a place where, you know, can I use the word salvation? Where there's salvation for us, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's time that we get together as a people. You know, we've had, we've had the, the civil rights, I call it human rights struggle. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of what has been done, a lot of the people who have benefited they have gone and they have joined the ranks yeah. of the who continue to have us in a stranglehold. Mm -hmm. But the fight has to continue inside our out. Maybe we can do what they were doing to us. We can put our people in there to make things happen for us. But we, we, just, we just can't sit still. And I'm so happy that you folks are out there projecting yourselves as those people who will not stand still and allow them to abuse us or to abuse our ancestors or to abuse our ancestral heritage. Mm -hmm. It's shocking that they would dig up our people not caring about them and dump their bones like trash without respect. And that some people, and as you mentioned, they, they couldn't do this to some other people no. who are out there. But, you know, <laughs> it's everything that's happening with our so-called education. You know, they put blinders on us so that we can only see the white path. Mm. We don't have the peripheral vision in which we must see everything and not the white path in front of us. Yes. And I'm hoping that with, you know, the cooperation of members of the UNIACL and some other people and, and black folks, we are going to be out there mm -hmm. now. And we're gonna, and like I was telling you earlier, we're gonna have the red, we do not walk without, and if there are people who fear the red, black and green, I'm sorry, and that's, you know, we don't fear anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The red, black, and green for us is what is our standard. Mm -hmm. When you talk about standard bearer, we bear the red, black, and green. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It stands for the blood of our people. Mm -hmm. It stands for the color of our people. Mm -hmm. And it stands for the land of our people, which is red, black, green. Mm -hmm. The struggle continues, sister. 
Thank from you. struggle and sisters, brother. I thank you very much thank for being you. part of this. And uh, I will see you when I see you thank and the struggle you. continues. And let me say this, some, some other group of people use this as a slogan at one time, free the land. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes, yes. It's our intention to work now to free that land where our people's bones are buried mm -hmm. and you must give it back to us mm -hmm. because we need it to continue mm -hmm. to project ourselves as a people, as a people who have, have pride mm -hmm. and a people who are not just pride in ourselves here as Americans, but as Africans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So an African burial ground is something sacred for us. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So I'm with you mm -hmm. and I hope the rest of my uh, members will say the same. Mm -hmm. So blessings, blessings to you. peace and love. Peace. And uh, for the future, I'm sure we will be holding hands together. Yes. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Brother Heru, uh, are, you are you there? I'm here. Uh, okay. If uh, First, let me say, uh, you know, we don't have an audience to, to uh, ask uh, the questions that I, uh, but I had some, some in mind, but I'm not, you know, it, it's, it's it's nine o'clock, and I said between nine and nine thirty, we, we had stretched it out to nine thirty. But I know Dr. Marshall; she has indicated that she's had a long day, <laughs> and I don't know what the Reverend has been doing. But I I I will just allow him to comfort her after that long day. So we we will we will make our departure here at this time. All right. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thank okay. You. Bye bye. All bye -bye. right. God bless.